travel and communicate. It touches almost every part of our lives. It has already helped win wars, solved seemingly insoluble problems, and launches into space. The age of computing hasn't even begun yet. We're, in, we're still in the dark ages. There's not going to be a clear distinction between human intelligence and machine intelligence as we go through this century. Most people today know what a personal computer is, and even something about its operation. Essentially, there are input devices, such as a mouse or keyboard, the brains of the machine, the CPU or central processing unit, and output devices, such as a monitor or printer. On the inside, the computer makes its magic by performing millions of little calculations per second. Basically, its electronic circuits have only two options. They can be switched on, or they can be switched off. In binary code, a 1 represents on, a 0 represents off. Therefore, a 1 in binary is also true, and 0 is false. Through these values, we get binary logic which allows the computer to compute. A binary code of ones and zeros is all the computer knows and uses to make calculations and turn normal people into authors, animators, and web surfers. The computer creates its magic by the speed at which it can calculate. Your average PC makes 100 million calculations a second, but that's nothing compared to some of today's industrial machines. This is Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, home of the fastest supercomputer in the world. The Department of Energy's Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative, ASCII White. We took as our building block for these large ASCII machines, the typical IBM workstation that you could go down and buy from anybody. And we put 8,000 of these together to create a computer that was much, much faster than anything that was available. The ASCII White machine has a speed of 12 trillion mathematical operations per second. And to break that down, the Earth's population is a little over 6 billion. So every man, woman, and child on the face of the Earth would have to add 2,000 numbers in one second to keep up with that machine. Like a silicon sentinel, the ASCII White is devoted to the service of the country. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories is responsible for ensuring the safety and performance of the nation's nuclear weapons. In 1992, President George Bush banned underground nuclear testing. That makes evaluating the arsenal very difficult. Now, the laboratory has turned to supercomputers to run simulations to determine the integrity of the aging weapons. If you think about a nuclear weapon and all of its components, you begin to understand how difficult that process would be. We have to be able to simulate every part of it. We have to be able to simulate the processes and physics that take place within it. These simulations are so complicated, even at 12 trillion calculations a second, it could take weeks to complete a test. The computer also has the power to model molecules. This helps scientists design experiments before going into the lab and understand what the results will likely be. The most effective way to get information from the computer into the human mind is by a visual display. Very fine detail. A giant high-resolution bank of video displays turns the computer's endless stream of ones and zeros into a brilliant pixelated tapestry. We need to see the context, we need to be able to understand how it all fits together, and then we use this simulation on a very fine scale as a one building block, an element for our much larger simulations that cover a much larger volume of space or a much larger system. Without this wall, we really wouldn't be able to understand the simulation. Ironically, as computer technology is getting smaller, Supercomputers like the white machine still take up a lot of space and require special attention. We're right now in the electrical room, which is really on the other side of the wall from the computer room. Uh, a computer the size of this one needs a lot of support equipment. The computer right now draws about 1.3 megawatts. That's somewhere around 1,300 homes. It requires the air handlers, it requires chillers. Three 675-ton chillers keep the white from overheating by circulating cool water through pipes beneath the floor. The machine took the coordinated effort of hundreds of brilliant minds. But the ASCII white computer can trace its ancestral lineage back to a man who wasn't too concerned about national security, but had a big interest in cattle. Charles Babbage was an English scientist who invented the cow catcher to keep steam trains from derailing upon striking bewildered bovines. 
He's also considered by many to be the father of the computer. Babbage was an extraordinary scientist. I mean, Babbage was a great scientist. Babbage was 100 years ahead of his time. You can't say that about many people, but you could say that about Babbage. In the uh, early 1800s, conceived of the idea of mechanical computers, that is, computers that um, would do more than just calculate, but could store um, information, could store numbers, and draw upon them when it needed it, and could print out its answers. Being a scientist, Babbage relied on the accuracy of mathematical, logarithm, and gravity charts. Computing these charts were people, called computers. Unfortunately, these computers often made mistakes, enraging the inventor. To err is human, but for Babbage, being human wasn't good enough. He first envisioned a complex system of gears and shafts that worked together to make calculations. After 10 years of work, however, he tossed the project out, only partially completed, to design an even more sophisticated device, a machine that possessed the basic components of modern computers. Punched cards provided input. A mechanism called the mill made the calculations, and the store held numbers like memory. He called it the analytical engine. The analytical engine performed calculations mechanically, victim of imprecise tools and lack of funding. It would be nearly 100 years before a programmable computation device would again be conceived. Spurred by a population explosion in America, the next step in the evolution of the computer came at the end of the 19th century. An endless stream of immigrants threatened to overwhelm the U.S. Census of 1890. In 1887, the Census Bureau was still hand-tallying the 1880 count. Desperate, the Bureau begged for another way to tabulate the results. That's when a former MIT instructor named Herman Hollerith introduced a series of machines that would make the census count as easy as one, two, three. Each person was represented by a paper card. Individuals punched out boxes relating to their age, sex, race, and occupation. Census workers then fed the punched cards into the machines. The tabulating was done with electricity. Using electrified pins, results registered on a series of clock-like dials. Other machines sorted cards. Hollerith's machines dramatically sped up the processing of information. In just six weeks, the 1890 census count of 62,622,250 was tallied. Hollerith then went on to commercialize that invention. He realized that the census was a great customer, but let's face it, you only get your order once every 10 years. So he went out and, and drummed up business among railroads, for example, and he formed a company which eventually became the basis for the IBM Corporation. Hollerith's invention was a milestone on the road from mechanical to digital computing devices. But it would take another 50 years and the destructive power of a world war to boot up the first true computer. Before the 1930s, mechanical computing devices were used to keep track of the population, railroad passengers, and life insurance records. But the first electronic digital computers were built with a much more compelling aim in mind, to help win a world war. One of the earliest machines was proposed by the British to break the German code known as the Enigma. Those involved believed winning the war depended on building such a device. One of the people who worked to break the Enigma code was Alan Turing. His work before the war helped to establish a theoretical basis for the computers built in the 1940s. North of London at a secret installation in Bletchley Park, the British built Colossus a computer-like machine designed to break the Enigma code. Colossus compared sequences of letters at a rate of 25,000 characters per second. The machine could only do this one job, matching letters, but it did it very well. 
Its deciphered German transmissions were called the ultra secret, the most closely guarded secret of the war. The Colossus essentially performed logical functions uh, on the letters of the alphabet, on a stream of uh, letters coming through uh, um, an intercepted radio message. It would not decode it, but it would try a number of combinations, which in many ways is similar to what a computer does. While Colossus was breaking German codes, across the Atlantic, engineers labored to build another computational device, a machine which would directly influence the design of all future computers. America was a powerhouse producer of war implements, but by 1943, there was a critical shortage of a surprising component of the war machine. Firing tables for artillery pieces. Firing tables allowed gunners to correctly aim their guns in different ranges, altitudes, temperatures, and wind conditions. Human computers frantically worked mechanical calculators to produce charts, but they had a hard time keeping up. During World War II, there were a lot of guns coming off the assembly line. There were a lot of firing tables to be calculated. It was a really big job, and it was slowing down the delivery of guns to the front. To solve the problem, John Mockley, a physicist from the University of Pennsylvania, proposed building a giant electronic computer that could figure charts in minutes, not hours. The Army, desperate for a device to help them win the war, reluctantly committed to the proposed cost of half a million dollars. Mockley and a brilliant graduate student in electrical engineering, Presper Eckert, set to work constructing ENIAC, the electronic numerical integrator and computer. Many times larger than Colossus, nothing close to ENIAC had ever been conceived. Nearly 100 feet long and weighing 30 tons, it contained almost 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors, 6,000 switches, and 18,000 delicate vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes burn out just like light bulbs. In a machine that contained 18,000 vacuum tubes, at least one had to be replaced every few minutes. After two years of intense work, the team completed ENIAC, three months after the Japanese surrender. Although it wasn't finished in time to help win the war, ENIAC was a marvelous machine. It could perform up to 5,000 additions, 357 multiplications, and 38 divisions every second. The interesting thing about the ENIAC was that it had a general purpose capability. It could be reconfigured to solve other problems. And there was never any problem finding work for the ENIAC to do. All the armed services clamored for time on the machine. Uh, industrial customers, university researchers wanted it. So it was kept busy right into the 1950s. By far the most complex machine of its time, ENIAC still lacked many of the qualities of a modern computer. Its memory was very primitive and could only store a maximum of 20 10-digit decimal numbers. It had to be laboriously rewired each time it was programmed and couldn't make logical decisions based on its calculations. But ENIAC had proven that computers could be constructed. Just before the end of the Second World War, John von Neumann, an advisor to Eckert and Mockley's ENIAC project, wrote a paper that was to greatly affect the next stage of computer design. Von Neumann possessed a photographic memory and was one of the principal scientists involved in the Manhattan Project. Von Neumann's paper delineated the structure of the modern computer. It was to have a processing unit, a controlling unit, memory, input and output. But most importantly, in the evolution of computers, it would hold its programming internally in its memory. Internally held programs give computers their power and versatility because an internal program can modify what it does based on data or the results of computations. Von Neumann's paper proposed a machine that truly had a general purpose capability. In this paper, he described the attributes of a computer, how it ought to be organized logically. That is, it needed to have a central processor where the calculations would be performed, it needed to have a memory where the program and data would be stored, needed to have an output unit, an input unit of some sort. He laid out the logical plan, the map, for a computer and pointed the direction for the future. 
The idea for storing programs internally was the last key to developing the true general purpose computer. But whether it was von Neumann's idea has long been hotly debated. Eckert and Mockley, who had worked with von Neumann, claimed they formulated internal programs as a natural part of their work building ENIAC. Although they couldn't stop and incorporate the idea into the machine, However, Eckert and Mockley weren't included as authors in the paper. They felt they had been betrayed. But realizing the computer might find itself useful in the business world, Eckert and Mockley formed their own computer company. They set to work on a machine they called the Universal Automatic Computer, UNIVAC. The UNIVAC, unlike previous one-of-a-kind machines, built to solve scientific or military problems, could be programmed to serve many purposes. The UNIVAC was also the first computer to be mass-produced and sold commercially. The machine could be programmed for a variety of data processing tasks, such as payroll, inventory, and billing. Compact magnetic tape drives stored data, and results were automatically printed. Still, very few people understood how useful a computer could be. That perception changed dramatically on election night, 1952 when CBS used a UNIVAC to predict the outcome of the presidential race between Dwight Eisenhower and Adlai Stevenson. Opinion polls said the race was too close to call. The UNIVAC figured otherwise. Engineers fed the computer early results of selected eastern precincts well before polls closed in the western states. Experts thought it was a tight race, but the UNIVAC predicted a landslide victory for Eisenhower. Even CBS didn't believe what the computer was saying and hesitated reporting the computer's results. But in the end, the UNIVAC was correct. The power and utility of the computer had been proven. After the success of UNIVAC, various companies began to see a future in computer development. IBM began to realize that computers would become smaller and less expensive and easier to use and that there would be a place in business for these machines and that indeed these machines might eventually replace punch card technology, their, their bread and butter. By the early 1960s, IBM dominated the large mainframe computer market. Business was becoming dependent on computers. The machines were getting smaller thanks to the switch from tube technology to transistors. And a race to the moon was about to make the computer smaller still. In 1961, America trailed Russia in the race for space. In the ever-increasing attempt to beat the Russians, NASA's goal was to land a man on the moon. It wouldn't be easy. When I first went to work for NASA in 1962, on the first day they gave me a 20-inch slide rule. And our calculations were primarily done on handheld calculators. We had a number of people that we would take our data sheets down to, and it was their job to sit there on these little uh, calculators. But astronauts couldn't rely on slide rules or handheld calculators in space. The mission required a sophisticated guidance computer. In the early 1960s, however, a machine as powerful as the one they needed took up an entire room. NASA looked to shrink the problem. Fortunately, the first great breakthrough on the road to miniaturization had already occurred. In 1947, Three scientists at Bell Labs invented the transistor. The transistor performed the same on or off function as vacuum tubes, but was much smaller and more reliable. Transistors were made with silicon and tiny wires. Silicon is a semiconductor. If a small voltage is supplied, it will act like a conductor, allowing a current to pass between wires. If there is no voltage, it will act more like an insulator, blocking the current. This characteristic of silicon is what enabled transistors to speak the binary language of computers and would make silicon the foundation of the computer industry. The next step in miniaturization occurred in 1959 when Robert Noyce and Jack Kilby, engineers for rival transistor manufacturers, independently came up with breakthroughs that led to the same revolutionary idea. An entire network of electronic components, transistors and all, incorporated onto a single chip of silicon. This great innovation in electronics was called the integrated circuit. In 1969, 5,000 integrated circuits made up the heart of each of two identical computers. 
one on the lunar orbiter, and one on the lander. For their size, these were the most powerful computers on Earth, or off. As Neil Armstrong took one small step in the lunar dust, Ted Hoff, an engineer with the Intel computer chip company, was making the last great leap in miniaturization. Developing an idea that would put an entire computer on a chip of silicon, the microprocessor. It was the invention, not just of integrated circuits, but of a particular kind of integrated circuit, the microprocessor, that, makes today's pers that made today's personal computers possible. Hoff had been told to design 12 separate integrated circuits to make a Japanese pocket calculator. He suggested placing the entire processing unit on a chip and programming it just like a computer. Intel developed the idea, and by 1970, they had a working model of a microprocessor. Computers were on their way to becoming smaller. However, they were still a long way from being easy to operate. Look what else we can do in here. One of the earliest attempts to simplify the computer's operation was spearheaded by Doug Engelbart. The computer scientist conceptualized a simple-to-use computer and even demonstrated a prototype in 1968 at the Fall Joint Computer Conference in San Francisco. It'll offer you a character. If I hit W, it'll say delete word. The arrow moves back and forth to give me feedback. My tracking spot changes. Wielding a keyboard and a pointing device he called a mouse, Engelbart worked with a computer 30 miles away, linked by microwaves, and demonstrated word processing and hypertext. Many in the audience went home inspired, but one group alone was to fulfill Engelbart's vision. That group was just down the road from San Francisco at Xerox Park. Xerox believed the future might be in computers and set out to build an easy-to-use machine. In 1973, Xerox introduced the Alto, which incorporated many of the innovations in personal computers we take for granted today. The Alto used a mouse, a graphical interface, built-in networking, and it printed on a laser printer. It should have revolutionized the industry, but at $18,000 per machine, the Alto wasn't marketed to individuals. Computers were still elite machines, owned by the government, large corporations, and universities. In the past, giant mainframes processed payrolls, kept track of records, and made scientific calculations. If a college was lucky enough to have access to a computer, students and professors shared time on it. But the chip market was growing. Processing speeds were going up, and prices were coming down. A revolution was at hand, and the charge wouldn't be led by a large corporation, but by a group of hobbyists and free-thinking engineers. Two of those revolutionaries were Steve Jobs and Steven Wozniak. In the mid-1970s, they started manufacturing a small computer in a Palo Alto garage. They called it the Apple One. Steve Jobs was a college dropout. But he was a college dropout with a difference. He was very intelligent. He had a lot of street smarts. He was also extremely ambitious. But perhaps more important than that, he knew the other Steve, Steve Wozniak, who was a brilliant hardware engineer. As chip prices came down, a few inexpensive build-it-yourself computer kits started appearing on the market. One of the first kits appeared on the cover of Popular Electronics in 1975. It was called the Altair. The Altair was touted as the world's first mini computer kit to rival commercial models. At $400 per kit, a lot of people were interested. These early computers, they were the first ones before the Apples, were really for technicians and computer engineers that kind of knew how to hook up wires and get other devices hooked up and make it work for them a little bit. So I, I thought, well, I'll just um, buy these chips, buy a few chips, get a microprocessor, and I'll design my own computer. It wasn't, you know, how will I outsmart the world? It was just, I want to make this computer more personal than switches that have up or down positions for toggling weird binary numbers in. Steve Jobs sold his Volkswagen, and Steven Wozniak sold his HP calculator to finance their company. In 1977, they introduced the Apple II, an attractive self-contained computer and keyboard. With the addition of a monitor and optional floppy disk drive, the look of the personal computer was beginning to take shape. The Apple II came standard with four kilobytes of memory. 
and at a base price of $1,200. It was also much less expensive than previous industrial machines. The Apple II helped put the personal in PC by making it a plug-and-play device. A buyer didn't have to spend time meticulously soldering parts together. The person could immediately start programming the computer or buy software developed by burgeoning software companies. Hoping to take a bite out of Apple's market share, in 1981, IBM introduced their version of a personal computing device, simply known as the PC. Computer sales continued to rise in the early 1980s. But before the personal computer could take over the planet, the machine still had to become a little more user-friendly, something anyone could operate. The early Apple computers, as well as all early personal computers, did not have graphical interfaces. They didn't have mice. Um, they had what's known as a command line interface. That is, you typed instructions into the computer, and your instructions appeared as text on the screen. Inspired by the work done at Xerox PARC, Apple took many of the Alto computer's best features, such as the graphic interface and mouse, improved upon them, and made an affordable machine. Apple introduced the Macintosh computer in 1984. What made the Macintosh easy to use was its operating system and applications, otherwise known as software. Software is the list of instructions that tell the computer what to do, whether it should act like a word processor or a spreadsheet or any other application. Increasingly, software was dominating the advances made in computers. And Bill Gates, the young president of a computing software company called Microsoft, was there to capitalize on the growing market. He would eventually become a household name, parlaying his vision into a vast software empire and becoming the richest man in the world. Back in 1981, IBM decided to use Microsoft's operating system, known as PC-DOS. As IBM clones appeared on the market, Microsoft was free to sell their MS-DOS system to rival computer companies as well. IBM didn't try to hold on to the software and the hardware, so having, having them in two separate companies was great for Microsoft. Everybody in the world could come and build an Intel computer, and Microsoft had the operating system. So what happened was, you walk into a computer store back in those days, and you would see brand after brand after brand after brand of all these compatible computers. And then you'd see a Macintosh. Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But Apple didn't feel flattered when Microsoft introduced their Windows platform for the PC. Windows imitated, some say stole, the graphic interface, pulled down menus and all that Apple had popularized. Well, there's this idea that that Bill Gates came into Apple and copied the graphical look and users to actually lead up into Windows. Because anybody, once they see it, you don't have to see it for very long. You kind of know this is the future. And once you go through that door, you're not coming back. The true story is more like we needed some software written. And Gates had a company, Microsoft, that wrote software. So we had to show him a computer and give him copies of it to write the software. There wasn't any other way. And I don't know if I call that exactly stealing. It's like being an opportunist and looking in the right places and negotiating the way you want to and getting what you want and making something off of it even though the other guy invented it first it's hard to call that stealing computer sales skyrocketed in the 1980s going from 500,000 machines a year in 1981 to 7 million by the end of the decade friendly machines and ever more sophisticated software excited imaginations but the revolution was far from over a worldwide communications network was destined to dramatically alter people's lives. Soon the entire planet would be caught in an inescapable web. Next, see how your home's getting connected. Hooking up your television, toaster, coffee maker, and microwave. In the 1990s, computer sales exploded, driven by an expanding worldwide web. I would say the internet is more important than personal computers, although you need a personal computer to use the internet. It's like, what's more important, the streets or the cars? The web is connecting us, but it's not as constrictive as it used to be. Wireless technology is making us mobile. Already, personal digital assistants and web appliances are further changing the look and role of computers. Microprocessors are everywhere. 
the line is blurring between computers, cell phones, appliances, and other electronics. It's the continued shrinking of chip technology that's spurring the evolution. What I'm holding up here is our manufacturing unit in silicon technology. And this particular example is a wafer of Pentium 3 microprocessors. It's roughly eight inches in diameter. And it holds over 200 Pentium 3 microprocessors. Each microprocessor can hold as many as 100 million tiny transistors. Chips are made by a process called photolithography. Chip makers start by coating a silicon wafer with a photosensitive material. Scientists then make a stencil of the design they want by etching a thin metal film with an electron beam. Ultraviolet light shines through the stencil and onto the photosensitive chip causing a chemical reaction and creating the circuitry for the layer. A chip is made by building layer upon layer. Those chips, which are basically mini computers, are finding their way into smart appliances. Discrete computers hidden in everyday devices are talking to each other via the web and by other wireless technologies. It turns out all of these devices, all of these things, that are in the home and literally you'll have a hundred different microprocessors in your home are all now getting connected to the internet are all now getting connected to a home network and are allowing people and things to access all of the resources that exist out on the internet but talking to your appliances via the telephone isn't a new idea and this lady she's calling her oven sound funny actually it's something that could happen in the future thanks to a Westinghouse idea still in development that makes it possible to operate your appliances by telephone. Probably either call me or send a message. Today, we might not see the necessity in calling our ovens, but wouldn't it be nice if the refrigerator ordered its own groceries? And why don't we go ahead and see what might have for dinner tonight? To bring up a shopping list. These are items that I already know that I needed, that I ran out of during the week. But let's see what we possibly else need. Let's run over to the cabinet and take a look and see what might be there. pretty much all but these two ingredients so what I want to do is add these ingredients to my shopping list so if I click on here they've been added to my shopping list so now what I can do is I can take my shopping list and I can either download it to a web-based phone in which if I just click on it the shopping list will come here I can have it go to a PDA or I can actually send it to like streamline.com and actually have them order it and deliver the food to right to my house right from here so you're seeing all of your home appliances from your automobile to your set-top box and game machines and television and home entertainment environments to your appliances your washers your dryers your refrigerators and your ranges and everything else all getting connected so that from a browser you can actually operate the automated home Tomorrow, the Westinghouse telephone control may allow you to feed your pets open or close your windows operate any of the appliances in your home even if you're miles and miles and miles away now if you're away from your home and somebody comes up rings the doorbell when it's connected, it will actually alert my phone. So I'm away, and from my phone, I can do several things. I can actually dial back into my home. I can talk to the person. I might download a picture of who they are. I might see it's, it's one of my kids. They forgot their keys. I'll just go ahead from my phone, because I can control the door. I'll let them in. Next up, mind-blowing future computers. Within 10 years, computers are going to disappear as discrete objects that we carry around. They'll be in our eyeglasses, beaming images directly to our retina. Following an old trend in the world of computers, things are getting smaller, much smaller. Hewlett Packard is working on a molecular computer. Dr. Stan Williams plans to use molecules instead of electric ones and zeros to make a computer work. Well, a switch, of course, is something that you can turn on and off. All right, so if you think of a wall switch, people talk about the actual mechanism of flipping the switch. That's called toggling. The way in which molecules switch is simply by changing shape. In one shape, they're on. In another shape, they're off. An electric current could flip the molecular switch, turning it into the fundamental mechanism of digital computing. But how will they wire the things together? We work very hard on, on what is known in the scientific community as self-assembly. In other words, we knew that it would be too, too expensive 
and very, very difficult to build tiny little wires that are the size of molecules using the, the standard techniques of lithography and etching and whatever. Dr. Williams and his associates grew parallel molecular wires, each only two atoms high and eight atoms wide. It turns out that we didn't actually pattern these wires. We didn't tell them where to go in any sense. We essentially deposited a small amount of erbium onto a silicon surface, heated it up, there was a chemical reaction between the two, and the result of the chemical reaction was the series of wires that you saw behind me. Dr. Williams envisions building molecular computers by trapping individual molecules between two sets of wires. With uh, this type of molecular memory, we could build so much memory on something the size of a fingernail, you could store easily the entire Library of Congress on that. Other research facilities are working on future computers that might use DNA or even quantum particles. With mass storage and raw computing power, the next generation might be computers modeled after the human brain. Artificial intelligence is the science and art of making computers that do things that we consider re require human intelligence. We are developing systems that can match or even exceed human intelligence within narrow domains, whether it's playing chess, diagnosing illness, guiding cruise missiles across terrains. We have systems that can operate at human levels within these well-defined tasks. What we don't have yet are systems that can understand human language with the flexibility of humans. That will come. Alan Turing was an early computer architect who worked to break the Enigma code during World War II. In 1950, he envisioned a time when computers would be able to think. When IBM's deep blue supercomputer beat reigning world chess champion Garry Kasparov, some lost a little respect for the game of chess. But others recognized this was a sign of intelligent machines to come. Running. Running Molecular electronics could even blur the line between man and machine. We'll have very powerful little computers that can travel through our bloodstream. They'll be the size of blood cells and they'll actually communicate wirelessly with our neurons. So we'll be able to actually enhance our own thinking capacity, speed up our thinking, increase human memory, increase our cognitive abilities and pattern recognition by combining our biological intelligence with these new forms of non-biological intelligence. Computers capable of cognitive thought thrill some and terrify others. Travel and communicate. It touches almost every part of our lives. It has already helped win wars, solve seemingly insoluble problems, and launch us into space. The age of computing hasn't even begun yet. We're, in, we're still in the dark ages. There's not going to be a clear distinction between human intelligence and machine intelligence as we go through this century. Most people today know what a personal computer is, and even something about its operation. Essentially, there are input devices, such as a mouse or keyboard, the brains of the machine, the CPU or central processing unit, and output devices, such as a monitor or printer. On the inside, the computer makes its magic by performing millions of little calculations per second. Basically, its electronic circuits have only two options. They can be switched on, or they can be switched off. In binary code, a one represents on, a zero represents off. Therefore, a one in binary is also true, and zero is false. Through these values, we get binary logic, which allows the computer to compute. A binary code of ones and zeros is all the computer knows and uses to make calculations and turn normal people into authors, animators, and web surfers. The computer creates its magic by the speed at which it can calculate. Your average PC makes 100 million calculations a second, but that's nothing compared to some of today's industrial machines. This is Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, home of the fastest supercomputer in the world. The Department of Energy's Accelerated Strategic Computing Initiative ASCII White. We took as our building block for these large ASCII machines the typical IBM workstation that you could go down and buy from anybody. And we put 8,000 of these together to create a computer that was much, much faster than anything that was available. The ASCII White machine has a speed of 12 trillion mathematical operations per second. And to break that down, the Earth's population is a little over 6 billion. So every man, woman, and child on the face of the Earth 
would have to add 2,000 numbers in one second to keep up with that machine. Like a silicon sentinel, the ASCII White is devoted to the service of the country. Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories is responsible for ensuring the safety and performance of the nation's nuclear weapons. In 1992, President George Bush banned underground nuclear testing. That makes evaluating the arsenal very difficult. Now, the laboratory has turned to supercomputers to run simulations to determine the integrity of the aging weapons. If you think about a nuclear weapon and all of its components, you begin to understand how difficult that process would be. We have to be able to simulate every part of it. We have to be able to simulate the processes and physics that take place within it. These simulations are so complicated, even at 12 trillion calculations a second, it could take weeks to complete a test. The computer also has the power to model molecules. This helps scientists design experiments before going into the lab and understand what the results will likely be. The most effective way to get information from the computer into the human mind is by a visual display. Very fine detail. A giant high-resolution bank of video displays turns the computer's endless stream of ones and zeros into a brilliant pixelated tapestry. We need to see the context. We need to be able to understand how it all fits together. And then we use this simulation on a very fine scale as a one building block and element for our much larger simulations that cover a much larger volume of space or a much larger system. Without this wall, we really wouldn't be able to understand the simulation. Ironically, as computer technology is getting smaller, supercomputers like the white machine still take up a lot of space and require special attention. We're right now in the electrical room, which is really on the other side of the wall from the computer room. Uh, a computer the size of this one needs a lot of support equipment. The computer right now draws about 1.3 megawatts. That's somewhere around 1,300 homes. It requires the air handlers, it requires chillers. Three 675-ton chillers keep the white from overheating by circulating cool water through pipes beneath the floor. The machine took the coordinated effort of hundreds of brilliant minds. But the ASCII white computer can trace its ancestral lineage back to a man who wasn't too concerned about national security, but had a big interest in cattle. Charles Babbage was an English scientist who invented the cow catcher to keep steam trains from derailing upon striking bewildered bovines. He's also considered by many to be the father of the computer. Babbage was an extraordinary scientist. I mean, Babbage was a great scientist. Babbage was 100 years ahead of his time. You can't say that about many people, but you could say that about Babbage. In the uh, early 1800s, conceived of the idea of mechanical computers, that is, computers that um, would do more than just calculate, but could store um, information, could store numbers, and draw upon them when it needed it, and could print out its answers. Being a scientist, Babbage relied on the accuracy of mathematical, logarithm, and gravity charts. Computing these charts were people, called computers. Unfortunately, these computers often made mistakes, enraging the inventor. To err is human, but for Babbage, being human wasn't good enough. He first envisioned a complex system of gears and shafts that worked together to make calculations. After 10 years of work, however, he tossed the project out, only partially completed, to design an even more sophisticated device, a machine that possessed the basic components of modern computers. Punched cards provided input. A mechanism called the mill made the calculations, and the store held numbers like memory. He called it the analytical engine. The analytical engine performed calculations mechanically, victim of imprecise tools and lack of funding. It would be nearly 100 years before a programmable computation device would again be conceived. Spurred by a population explosion in America, the next step in the evolution of the computer came at the end of the 19th century. 
an endless stream of immigrants threatened to overwhelm the U.S. Census of 1890. In 1887, the Census Bureau was still hand-tallying the 1880 count. Desperate, the Bureau begged for another way to tabulate the results. That's when a former MIT 